Hi folks, Chamfering Infusion 360. Let's walk through all the nitty gritty. Why do we have two different ways to do chamfering? How do we handle situations where we've got custom angles or larger chamfers that are bigger than our tools? Let's walk through it. Welcome to another Fusion Friday. Before you watch this, I would actually encourage you to click here for the card, head over to the NYC CNC website. You can download this F3D file and you can walk along, you can play and experiment, and you can use these tools and operations in your own Fusion projects. I've got three different versions of effectively the same platter. I created this from a simple sketch, one inches tall, three inch radius, and we've got a 0.4 inch wide or tall 45 degree chamfer on it. When you already have a chamfer modeled from CAD as we do in this first example, my preference is to use the 2D, 2D contour option. And that's what I've done here. I've got a quarter inch 45 degree chamfer tool selected under geometry. We pick the bottom edge, not the top edge, but rather the bottom edge. And as we simulate that and walk around, you can see that the tool is creating our chamfer and it's slightly over and down from the edge. That is accomplished via the Passes tab, Chamfer Tip Offset. If you read that pop-up, it explains what this is doing. It keeps you from using the very tip and the area around the tip of the tool to cut because that tends to be the weakest point of the tool, the first to chip or break. There's very poor cutting ability, surface feet, and chip evacuation. So really, really good idea to always do this. The problem is obviously that this tool is much too small to machine this chamfer. We set it up like this simply to demonstrate, again, the point that you need to click the bottom curve. A common question that we get though is, can I use this relatively small tool to cut this large chamfer? And the answer is yes, but the only way I know how to do it is a little bit hacky. And we did that here under the 2D contour with multiple depths of cut. If we click on it once, and if we simulate it, you can see what's happening is it's going to machine the bottom outside ch chamfer first, and we would have to be very conscious of our, our width of cut and our speeds and feeds here because we've got quite a bit of engagement in material removal uh, given the capabilities of a quarter inch tool, depends on the material and so forth. But what this is going to do is it's going to take progressive cuts walking up that chamfer. Um, you will find that it is very difficult, if not, if not basically impossible, to get this to look uh, as clean as it would with some of the other methods like turning it on a lathe or using a larger tool or uh, interpolating it with a ball or bullnose end mill. So really, it's cool that we could do this, but in practice, I think it's not going to work very well. So how did we do this? If we head back into our model, I created a new version of our platter. I've activated it. I'm gonna rewind the timeline at the bottom of your screen. So if we start with our original sketch, That's just like we looked at in the beginning of this video. We will then revolve that sketch and we've got the same platter we talked about. So what happened next? So I created these four lines or these four breakdowns. I'm gonna turn the body off so we can see that sketch a little bit better. So I've got one, two, three, and then the bottom one is the fourth. So how did I do that? Let's start, we'll show you here in a second and start over from scratch. Uh, but after we got those lines, what I did is I projected just two of the four, the alternating pairs. So in this first revolve, I did the second and fourth, which creates these two platters. And then on the next revolve, we did the first and the third, and we made sure to have the operation be new body. And what that did, is it created this stack of bodies. So I've got four individual bodies, body one, two, three, and four. So let's walk through how we created those sketch lines to do what we just talked about. I'm gonna hit P for project. I'm gonna click on the Z X plane. I'm gonna project in this curve and that curve. 
I'll turn my body one off now. So I've only seen those. And to make it easy, I'm going to hit L for line. And I'll join these two together. So that shape there, if we turn our body back on for a second, represents this section. Then you can either hit L for line and just sketch a line across. Make sure it's horizontal. And then hit D for dimension. And that got constrained automatically to the midpoint, which I didn't want to do. So I'll click once on that little triangle. If you notice, that is the midpoint constraint. That's something, again, I think Fusion could do a better job of explaining to folks. But clicking on it once and hitting delete will then let me change that to say, I've got to delete that dimension and do it over again, but we'll say 0.1 inches down. So this is what will drive uh, the depth of cut uh, for this chamfer tool here. The other way we can do it, instead of sketching a line, is go to sketch offset. If we click this first line, it puts it up the red line. So I'm going to hit negative 0.1, and that's going to sketch an offset line 0.1 inches away from that line there. Click OK. Good news is it's 0.1 inches across. Bad news is it didn't extend all the way over because if we notice, we just offset this line. So it stopped here and it actually extended to the left further than I needed to. We, didn't, we don't have to trim this away, but if we wanted to, we could hit T for trim, trim that. And now S on your keyboard for the shortcut, E, X, click extend. This is a cool little feature where if you click the end of that line, it automatically extends it all the way over. Now, unfortunately, do doing that just got rid of our 0.1 inch offset, which I didn't want to have lost. So if I click it again, we can redimension that in. And you could do the same thing. Sketch, extend, extend that line out. Again, unfortunately, extend breaks that uh, dimension, which is, makes it probably not worth it doing. The first two options that we walked through use the 2D contour option. So why then do we have 2D chamfer? 2D chamfer is great when you don't have a chamfer modeled in your CAD part. A lot of times I will use this because I don't like modeling every little chamfer across every feature, every part. It takes it more difficult to handle other cam operations, and it adds a lot of unnecessary faces uh, and complexity to your CAD model when a lot of times you just want an edge break. Here, we're putting a quite a large chamfer on it, which may have to do more with the functionality or aesthetic of the part. So it would generally be more common to see it actually modeled. Nevertheless, having the larger shape helps exaggerate the right workflow to use the tool. So again, 2D, 2D chamfer. I'll edit the one that we've already made. Now we've got a very large chamfer tool here, which is pretty unusual. Uh, I don't know about you, but I do not have a one and a quarter inch uh, solid chamfer tool in our uh, in our toolbox here at the shop. But again, the point is that you select the only curve that is an option, which is this top curve. What that means is it doesn't really work well in our experience when you have the chamfer model, which is one of the confusions and complexities behind the nomenclature and which do you use when. So again, 2D chamfer works great when you don't have a chamfer already modeled. Under the passes tab, what do you want your chamfer width to be? In this case, the 0.4 inches. Uh, and again, this would be generally more commonly used for a smaller chamfer or an edge break chamfer uh, in something that wasn't in the CAD model. Simulate that and you can see that we'll walk around and create our chamfer. I created a sketch, which I'll toggle on just to show you if we have that sketch down 0.4 inches that is creating the correct geometry of that chamfer. You would generally want to also do a chamfer tip offset where we extend that tool, say 0.05 inches over and in, to the right and down uh, so that we are not cutting with the very tip of the tool. So you can see here as it comes around, again, we're saving that very tip of the tool and not having it do any of the actual cutting action. And you can see the tools intersecting right at our line as I come right around to the corner or edge, you can see it the intersects at the correct location for that chamfer geometry. Again, having the larger chamfer in this example helps show one of the major weaknesses of 2D chamfer. And I think uh, this is something that will change in future versions of Fusion 360. But you cannot do multiple widths of cut or multiple passes. And here, that would be really important because this was a really large tool. You would have a lot of tool pressure. It would likely be chattery or very difficult to get a good surface finish or a reliable process here. So you would want to take one or more 
passes and 2D Chamfer does not allow that, whereas 2D Contour, we'll come back to here in a second, does allow that. Here's where 2D Chamfer, though, really shines. Really cool functionality. I grabbed this part, hub and jaws, from your cam samples. Everybody has access to this in your Fusion 360 uh, data panel. Just scroll to the bottom and go into the cam samples folder. We've got an edge right here, which does not have a modeled chamfer, but we very well may want to put a very light edge break chamfer around this edge. 2D chamfer. I've got a 3 16 45 degree chamfer mill already loaded up. Under geometry, I'll click that edge. Now, if we started that toolpath right here, that chamfer tool would crash or collide into our raw material or cause a gouge or a crash or a tool mark. Not good. Watch what happens when we click OK, though. It starts right here. And as it moves in, it's starting that chamfer all the way over here. Pretty cool. So why is it doing that? It's because 2D chamfer is, unlike most of the other options in your 2D dropdown, it is what's called model aware. So when we go into the settings under passes, chamfer clearance. And if you read this pop-up, specifies how far the tool stays away from the model of areas of the model that are not being chamfered. And that diagram with the two yellow bars shows exactly what I'm referring to, which is it will chamfer as much as it can without colliding into your model or rather here staying one thousandth of an inch off. That's a little bit tight, but even five thousandths should work just fine. Now, why is the chamfer starting all the way over here? Well, again, if we look, when it enters in, the body of the tool is pretty close. That should be that five thousandths we referred to. We should, though, be able to hack this and get it a little bit of a better chamfer by adding to the chamfer tip offset and cutting higher up on the tool, which is going to pull the body away from our part some. So I'm going to duplicate this, edit it, and under passes, let's increase that chamfer tip offset to, say, 0.07. And you can see we're getting further back on our part. And you can see because we're cutting higher up, we're really close. We might have a little bit of room left to even push it a little further. Say 0.075. There we go. Coming really close to that edge there. And that can be a really nice way to make a nice chamfer. And one of the things I like about this is... It stinks to ruin a part with a mistake on your chamfering cam. When you're already done with the part, you're just trying to do the right thing by putting really nice, you know, three or fourth out edge break chamfers along it. That last thing you want to do at that point is gouge an otherwise perfectly good, ready to ship part. So 2D chamfer is awesome. Two things I'd like to see them add again are multiple widths of cut. And it'd be really nice for them to have an automatic calculation for chamfer tip offset to say, push it all the way to the top edge of the tool short of, say, 10 thou. You don't want to cut right where your chamfer tool straightens out because sometimes you'll raise a burr or create a, a mark line on the tool there. So you want to stay just at the top of the angled section of the chamfer tool, just, again, shy of where it goes straight. Again, as I mentioned, the nice thing about the 2D contour version is that it allows us, under passes, to check roughing passes. We can set the step over width and how many passes we want to take. In this case, I'm doing seven passes. 50 thou each, that would be a much more appropriate way to use a tool as we come in. We turn on stock, you can see each pass is cutting a little bit more off. Now this is very similar to cutting threads where each time you push that tool in further, the hypotenuse or the length of the area that you're cutting increases. So each in even increment in of 50 thousandths is actually cutting a lot more material. So I mentioned that because be careful if the cut starts out fine, don't walk away from the machine because by the time it starts getting to those last few passes, you're asking the machine and the tool and the rigidity uh, requirements have increased or you're asking more of it. So just be aware of that. All right, three more ways to go. The next two are using 3D contour to interpolate the, around this chamfer. So here we've got a ball end mill. We're starting out by just walking all the way around it and interpolating down that surface like so. You can see this residual scallop lines. Those are something you can define by your maximum step down, depending on the resolution or the quality uh, that you want out of the tool. You could also use this as a roughing strategy before you came in with a larger 
tool like our you know, sort of fictitious one inch chamfer tool. Uh, but you could use this sort of a strategy to rough out that material and ask less of that very uh, final tool. What we've done here is we've added in the comments what we've changed to each of these two recipes. So I took the first recipe and I added contact point boundary. And what that does is it ensures that the first operation is making good use of the tool. If we compare these two tool paths, you can see the first one is starting here. Why is it starting there? Again, shout out to Rob Lockwood. He's got a great channel where he walks through some of the details of this stuff and has been helpful in how we've learned some of these less self-explanatory terms. But here we've got the geometry tool containment set to tool center on boundary. What that means is the tool is starting right here because that's the center line of the tool. So that is our containment zone, our boundary. Now, we're actually controlling this tool path not with a machining boundary selection, but rather a silhouette of the part that you can see from the pop up there. And I'm, what I'm really doing, which is cool, is using slope. So I'm saying look for eligible material that's anything between 40 and 50 degrees. That happens to be a 45 degree slope, so it finds it just fine, and that's what creates that tool path. Contact point boundary generally is something I found you want to do it for most uh, or many at least of your 3D tool paths. However, there's one problem if you look at this, which is that we're machining from the top down. So I don't like doing that because this whole tool path, you're going to be cutting with the leading edge of this tool, which includes the center bottom section. And at, that, at the center of that ball end mill, you have very little room for chip evacuation. You've got very low surface footage and you don't have much gullet or relief area behind the flute. So generally, I don't want to cut with that whatsoever. So the last thing that we do is we add bottom up, go to edit, passes, and I checked order bottom up, and all that does is changes the order so that it starts at the bottom and works its way up, which is great because that means this whole time I'm never actually touching the center of the tool to do any cutting, but rather I'm cutting with the much better area of the tool, and when I say better, you've got better surface footage, you've got better chip evacuation, you've got a better room for that chip to form and then be sheared away and then evacuated out. That's the best way to do this. The next strategy, the exact same thing, the exact same cam, we just switched from a ball nose end mill, which is a fully radius tool, to a bull nose, which is a tool where you just have a radius in the corner. When you use one of these, for example here, corner radius mills, you just want to be conscious and make sure that you model it correctly. So if we go look at this example of a 3 8 inch, you can purchase them with different corner radiuses. Try to keep the tools labeled correctly or put them back in the correct box because, because it can be difficult to see the difference between a 45 thou and a 60 thou uh, rad. But I assure you, if you model it incorrectly in CAM, uh, it will, it will uh, be evident that it's the wrong tool. And last but not least, a little bit cheating for this version of the Fusion Friday, but worth including nevertheless, which is that one of the best ways to machine this chamfer would be on a lathe, or if you're fortunate enough to have a machine like a mill turn, uh, quite easy. Uh, it also highlights just how easy it is to flip between uh, machining and turning here in Fusion 360. We use our lathe template, create from template, lathe and use an OD profiling strategy, which is going to rough it out and then give a finishing pass along it. Uh, obviously that's one of the best ways, especially when you've got a larger chamfer like this to remove that material efficiently. Hope you learned, hope you enjoyed folks. Head over to the NYC CNC website. That's one of our focuses for 2018 is to really put out uh, as the best content we can on helping you learn not only Fusion 360 CAD and CAM and other components of Fusion 360, but also everything related to manufacturing entrepreneurship, setting up machines, running parts, bringing products to market, encouraging and inspiring other entrepreneurs. Take care, folks. See you next Friday.